All right, Facebook, I've got you guys. Hi, let me get this all. Okay, Facebook, hopefully you guys can see, you can feel like it, feel free to comment as you're joining in. Let me get Instagram going. All righty. All right, I think, ah, I think we're live. Okay, so as you guys join in, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is officially, hi guys, hi Kara, officially week two of our virtual ELA lessons, which is making me so excited because I love that we're continuing this, continue, continue to support each other and support teachers with everything going on. So welcome students. Hopefully you guys are all joining in from your homes, wherever you're at, and ready for another fun literacy lesson. So. Today's book, I don't wanna, I'm not even gonna wait to share, I'm gonna tell you the book right away because I love this book. It's by one of my favorite authors, his name is Lester Laminat, and the book we're gonna read today is called Saturdays and Tea Cakes. And you may have, maybe you've already heard this book before. It's actually, it's actually a one that I'm sure your teachers know about and maybe have read to you. And if you have heard it, that's awesome. It will be great to hear it again. You'll get so much more out of it the second time. And if you haven't heard it, you are in for a treat because it's a wonderful, wonderful book. So. As you're popping in, students, teachers, parents, feel free to comment. What grade are you in? Where are you, where are you from? What's your name? So we can interact because I get to be your teacher for a day, which is so much fun for me. And I'm so excited about it. So my name is Mrs. Cap, is what most, most of my students call me. My last name is Capitosta, but that's a little complicated. So we stick with Mrs. Cap. Instagram, remember, I can't see your comments, but I can comment after. So feel free to still chime in. Facebook, I can see your comments. When I ask questions, please answer. Think about Think of it like we're in our classroom right now. And students, you guys just jump right in, share with me your answer, what you're thinking, and we can have a great discussion and learn together. All right, so for our book today, we are gonna have a couple focuses for our ELA learning. If you tuned in yesterday, you got to hear an amazing lesson and a really fun book from Mrs. King. And Mrs. King taught you guys a couple different things, but one thing she taught you was about figurative language and similes. Hi guys, oh, there's a Dean. My son's name is Dean. Hi Dean from Oklahoma. Um, so welcome here. We're gonna, we're gonna focus on a couple different things. The first thing is a review of what Mrs. King taught you yesterday. So Mrs. King taught you about similes. If you can remember what a simile is, either from what Mrs. King taught you yesterday or from your prior knowledge, maybe you already learned this this year, feel free to pop in a definition in the comments. So tell me students, what is a simile? Bonus points if you can think and give me an example of a simile. So what is a simile? And give me an example of one. See if any of you guys, I'll give you guys a minute or so to think about it, type it in. And as you guys are answering that, I wanna remind you that a simile is a type of figurative language. So figurative language means that it's not taken literally. So it's not exactly what it says. It's the author's way of being more descriptive and helping us visualize, visualize things better. So I see a couple of definitions. Good job guys, yes. So a simile is comparing two, or can be more things using like or as. And I've seen this example as hungry as a horse. Yes, yeah, so we're about lunchtime, right? So if you didn't eat lunch yet, you might be hungry as a horse. I could say, oh, I'm so hungry. And you would know that I meant I was hungry. But if I say I am hungry as a horse, you're like, oh my goodness, she is, she's starving, right? So we're comparing two things using like or as. It's an example of figurative language. And as students, as writers, as readers, we can use figurative language to make our writing more descriptive and make what we're learning more descriptive. So thinking about books that you read, do you see similes in your books? I'm sure you do. Do you use similes when you talk every day? You probably do. So great job remembering what a simile is. We're gonna learn all different types of figurative language throughout these lessons, but we're gonna continue to focus on similes. The second one I'm gonna teach you guys about today is personification. That's a fancy word. Everyone say that with me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it, then you say it, ready? Personification personification good job so personification has the word person in it so what is personification it's when you give a non-person right so like an animal a desk a table a chair a non-person a person quality so if you said the desk was bored with all it heard a desk can't hear right they don't that's not true they can't hear anything or the wind whispered in the night the wind can't really whisper, right? That's a non-human thing, non-person, being given a person quality. And the reason I'm reviewing these two, simile and personification, is because our book, Saturdays and Tea Cakes, has a ton of figurative language. 
Now, maybe your teacher put these in your Google Drive or if you use Seesaw, or maybe they sent you a link to these. And if they haven't, you might you can download these. There'll be a link in the in the caption when this video is over. I made a bunch of freebies for us to use, some little activities for us to do as we're doing this. And one of the activities looks like this. I'm gonna hold it up so you guys can see. I'm gonna check on Instagram, make sure they can still see. Instagram, are we good? We can see everything. Good. Okay. So Instagram can see too. Good. Okay. So looking at this, one of the activities in there is just a quick little sort. This is how many similes can you find in the book and what other types of figurative language can you find? So if you have a paper and a pencil with you right now, on your paper and pencil, at the very top with your paper and pencil, at the very top of your page, all I want you to do is write the word simile. S-I-M-I-L-E. Write simile. And then if you want to write below it, if you want to be challenged, if you're in fourth or fifth grade, you should do this too. So if you're in kindergarten, first or second, just write simile. That's perfect. If you're in third, even fourth, fifth grade, I want you to write person. We'll put that abbreviation of personification. And you're just going to keep that little note up there because as I'm reading today, I want you to tally mark when you hear a simile or you hear an example of personification. You don't have to write it down because I want you to be focused on the book and enjoying it. But I just want you to do a little tally mark next to simile or personification when you hear them when reading the book. Remember, simile, comparing using like or as, personification, giving a non-person a person quality, okay? All right, you guys ready for our second focus? We're gonna do two things, just like we did with our last week lesson, we're gonna focus on two things. The second thing we're gonna focus on, you can see the big words whoop, behind my head, there it is, setting. So we're gonna focus on the setting of a story. Now again, I know we have, we have students that are in grades K through five. So we're gonna talk about how each of you are gonna do this a little bit differently based on what you are expected to know as a kindergartner, a first grader, second grader, third grader, fourth grader, fifth grader, maybe even older, right? Because this is, this is something that every story has no matter what age you are. So someone, if you want to, type in the comments if you can, give me a quick definition of what is setting. When I'm asking what the setting of a story is, what am I asking? Every story has one. Every story has to be a setting. In fact, in daily life, we have a setting in what we do, right? This is my setting. I'm in my basement playroom for my little boys. This is my setting. Couple comments coming through. Good job, guys. All right, yeah, so the setting of a story tells us, I see when and where the story takes place. Awesome job. Now again, if you are a kindergartner, first grader, second grader, even a third grader, your goal today as we're doing this is to focus on the when and the where. When does the story take place and where does the story take place? All of those comments coming through, you guys are doing an awesome job. So when you think of setting, I want you to think of it like a puzzle. Because here's what we do as readers a lot. We forget that setting isn't just when it takes place and it isn't just where it takes place. It has to be more than those things to all fit together to really understand the story. So we have a three piece puzzle right here. One piece of our puzzle is like you guys said, when, when the story takes place. The second piece of our puzzle is where it takes place. All right, now my fourth, fifth graders and older, this is my challenge to you. There's a third piece of the puzzle that we start to learn as we get older. Here's, it's a fancy word. I'm gonna teach you a fancy word for it and then I'm gonna teach you one that helps you remember it better. So our third piece of the puzzle is environment. So our third piece of the puzzle is environment. Hopefully you guys can hear me saying that. So environment is the fancy word kind of for the weather or the mood of the book, okay? So I'm gonna put environment slash weather. Now again, fourth, fifth, sixth graders older, I'm challenging you here because environment or the mood, it is the weather outside, but it's also the feeling or the mood or tone inside the story, right? So we're looking for all of those things. So now let's look at, let's review this again, guys. Setting, it's a big puzzle. All of these things make up the setting. If you really understand the setting, it helps you understand the story better. So setting is when the story takes place, where the story takes place, and then my fourth, fifth, my older kiddos, you have a third piece to your puzzle. Yours is also the environment and the weather. Again, reviewing these, when is not just on, in this case, we know it's gonna be on a Saturday, right? It's also past, present, or future. It's also time of day. It's also time of the year. So when can be any sort of time that you know, if there's a time on the clock, it can be time on the clock. 
Where is not just at a house. What else do you know? What does the house look like? Describe it. Where, what city, state is this house in? Anything else you know about the where? And then the environment, that fancy word, environment or weather, remember, is telling me more about what is the weather like outside and the mood or tone inside. That's all part of the setting. So it's a really complicated puzzle, isn't it? But I know that you guys are going to rock understanding that because we're going to practice it with our book, Saturdays and Tea Cakes. So two things as we're reading this today. First things first, remember at the top of your little notebook paper, you wrote simile or personification. If you're a fourth, fifth, or sixth grader, you added person for that. You're going to tally, put a little mark when you hear a simile or a personification. All right, now the next thing I want you to do is on your piece of paper, draw yourself a little box. If you are a kindergartner, a first grader, or a second grader, or a third grader, I want you to divide your box into two. So just divide it in half. And I want you to write when on one side and where on the other. If you are a fourth, fifth, or a older, I want you to divide your box into thirds, into three sections, and write when, where, environment, or you can write weather. You can choose, or you can write, or you can write both, environment slash weather. All right. So as we're reading, I don't want you to write anything down yet, but I want you to be thinking of those things because when we're done reading the story today, during your workshop time at home, your goal is going to be to describe the setting of Saturdays and Tea Cakes to me with these things, the when, the where, and the environment. All right, so here's our book, Saturdays and Tea Cakes by Lester Laminat. Remember, listen for that figurative language. When I was nine or 10 years old, I couldn't wait for Saturdays. Every Saturday, I got up early, dressed, and rolled my bike bicycle out of the garage. Every Saturday, I coasted down our long, steep drive, slowing only enough to make the turn onto Thompson Street, then left onto Bell's Mill Road. Pedal, 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 past Mrs. Cofield's house. Pedal, 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 around the horse pasture and up the hill past the cemetery where my grandfather was buried. Pedal, 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 past Mrs. Grace Owen's house and on up to Chandler Phillips 66. Ooh, Chandler Phillips 66, I want you to look at the picture of this place and tell me, does this tell you more about the when for past, present, or future? Hmm. Every Saturday, I coasted over the black hose by the gas pumps just to make the bell ring. Then I dropped my kickstand and checked the air in my tires. I stopped at Chandler's for another reason, too. That's where I crossed the highway that ran right through the center of our town. My mother always said, you stop and you look both ways when you get to Chandler's. I don't care if the light is green. I'll hear about it if you don't. And I knew she would, too. In our little town, Everyone knew everybody and told everything to anyone who would listen. So I always looked both ways. Pedal, pedal, pedal across Ross Street, then left for a slow coast down behind the bank of Heflin, where I turned right onto Bedwell and whoosh, I zoomed downhill as fast as I dared. Pedal, pedal, Pedal up the next hill and left onto Almond Street. It was a long stretch to Mr. White's. I always stopped there to catch my breath in the shade of an old oak tree. One more small hill and then a right onto Gator Street. Now I could see my grandmother's drive. So now we know where he's going. He's going to his grandmother's house. I know in this time right now, we're all kind of in our homes, we probably are missing some of our family members. So hopefully this can help us think of those wonderful times that we have that we can't see them right now. One, two, three, four driveways and one last turn to the left. This was where my tires gave up their humming on pavement and began the crunching of gravel. Just before reaching Mamaw's back porch, I slammed on my brakes, sending a shower of tiny pebbles into her flowers. Every Saturday, Mamma was there, sitting on her old metal glider. Crick, crack, crick, crack, sipping a cup of red diamond coffee and waiting. She was waiting for me. No one else, just me. 
every Saturday, Mama called out, come on into this house, let's have us a bite to eat. In Mama's big kitchen, sunlight poured through the windows like a waterfall and spilled over the countertops, pooling up on the checkerboard floor. Every Saturday, she had hot biscuits, sweet butter, and golden eagle syrup waiting on the kitchen table. Every Saturday, she poured a little coffee in my cup and filled the rest with milk and two spoonfuls of sugar. Then before long, Mamma said, we best clear these dishes away and get out that yard before it gets too hot. I followed her out to the back porch. Let me put a little water on these ferns, she said. You go on ahead to the car house. That's what Mamma called the garage. I'll be out directly. Looking at the illustrations again and also looking at the language to kind of figure out that when, past, present, or future, and also to figure out that where, maybe what part of the country this might be in. By the time I pulled the old lawnmower from the garage, Mamma was already in the garden picking plump, ripe tomatoes for our lunch. Every Saturday, I pulled the starter rope again and again while the mower sputtered and spit. Finally, that old mower started and I struggled to push it through the dew wet grass, leaving row after row of fresh stripes on the lawn. From time to time, the mower choked on mouthfuls of wet grass that clung to the blades into my bare legs. But by early afternoon, the dew pearls were gone, the grass was mowed, and dry, and I was soaked with sweat. Every Saturday, I pushed the mower back into the garage, trudged to the back porch, and flopped onto that old glider. Crick, crack, crick, crack. I love seeing the comments, people saying they saw a simile right there. Yep, the sunlight poured through. That was on the previous page. We did see a simile, so that's my favorite line in the book. Sunlight poured through the windows like a waterfall and spilled over the countertops, pooling up on the checkerboard floor. There's actually personification in that too. So good. Mamma soon appeared with a tall glass of sweet iced tea. You just cool off and rest a spell. I'm gonna make us a bite to eat. Before long, she came back with two big tomato sandwiches on hamburger buns. Every Saturday, I gobbled mine down like a hungry dog, but she nibbled at hers like a bird. Now then some good tomatoes, she said. I know how you like a good tomato sandwich. Don't they taste a whole heap better when you just picked them? We sat there a while listening to the calls of blue jays and the rhythm of that old glider. Then Mamma looked at me sort of sideways and said, I reckon I know a boy who'd like something sweet to eat. And I grinned. Yes, ma'am, I reckon you do. Yeah, the illustrations in this book are incredible. Come on then, Mamma said, heading toward the door. Let's get in this kitchen and see if we can't make us a mess. Every Saturday, she spread a cloth over the red countertop and scattered a fistful of flour across it. Sending it into sending a cloud into the air. Then she set out a big bowl. Mamma dipped a china teacup into the canister of flour, scooped out a cupful, and skimmed over the top with her finger. Then she dumped the flour into the bowl and added sugar from her black cookie jar. She let the mixture drift through her hands like I sifted sand at the beach. Oh, it's a great visual, isn't it? When it felt right, Mamma said, Look in the fridge and air. That's what she called her refrigerator. And find me two sticks of blue bonnet. There's a great example of how a simile helps us better understand the story. If he would have said that she sifted the flour and sugar, many of you might not know what that meant. When he said that she sifted the flour through her hands like he does with sand at the beach, oh, I can picture that with it, that simile right in my head. It's a great example. I pulled open the refrigerator and got out the margarine. I unwrapped the sticks and dropped them into the bowl. I mixed and mashed and mixed and mashed until the ingredients disappeared into a paste. It was smooth and pale yellow and smelled like fresh cotton candy at the county fair. Mamma pinched off a little to taste. I expect a bit more sugar in this. She sprinkled sugar until the dough tasted just the way she thought it ought to. Now get me three eggs, she said. 
I tap the first egg too hard, making it splatter onto the counter and down the outside of the bowl. I reckon we can call that half an egg, Mamma said. Here, let me show you how to do it. Just tap them easy like and pull the shell apart over the bowl like this. Now you do the next one. It was hard work blending those eggs into the mix with a long wooden spoon. Mamma pinched another taste. My goodness, buddy, we didn't put no vanilla in here. Reach up in that cabinet and get me down the bottle of vanilla flavor. When the dough tasted just right, Mamma rolled it out onto the flour dusted cloth. Then I cut the tea cakes with the rim of an old tin can. We carefully lifted the circles onto a cookie sheet and put them in the oven to bake. 375 degrees for 15 minutes. Those 15 minutes seem to last forever. Are they ready, Mamma? Not yet, buddy. Are they ready now, Mamma? Not yet, buddy. Let's give them a little bit longer. Are they ready yet, Mamma? I reckon they might be. She opened the oven door and the kitchen filled with a smell sweeter than summer gardenias. The smell of tea cakes. Every Saturday I reach for one still steaming on the baking sheet. You better wait, buddy. They gonna be mighty hot just yet. You ever baked something before or made some food and you just cannot wait to eat it? It's so hard for it to cool down. And then I always try it anyways and burn my tongue. It's the worst. So I can definitely relate to that. We waited until the tea cakes were cool enough to lift from the baking sheet. Then we set them off on a plate. Every Saturday, I ate one, and then another. And I looked at Mamma. Is that all you want, bud? You be sure to eat all you want. We made them tea cakes just for you. When I had eaten all I could, she set a few off on a saucer for herself and put the rest on a big sheet of aluminum foil. She folded the edges into a little handle at the top. Now you put these out there in your bicycle basket so you won't forget them. Every Saturday, as I pedaled over the gravel again and out Mamaw's drive, I glanced back over my shoulder. Every Saturday, Mamaw was there, sitting on her old metal glider and waving. She was waving to me. No one else, just me. Don't worry, Mamma. I won't ever forget. End of our book. Oh, isn't that such a sweet story? And the reason I chose this is because right now, when you think about what's kind of going on and we're all in our homes right now, we probably are kind of not able to see our grandparents or aunts or uncles or people that you miss. This is a great story that remembers an ex experience that he had with his, his mamma, his grandma, every single Saturday. And him, he wrote this story to remember it. So I want to do a little writing with that today as well. So let's take a look before we wrap it up. Let's take a look at our anchor chart. And like I said, we are focused on similes and personification and focus on the setting of a story. So I know I saw a lot of you guys typing as you found similes, there was lots in there and there was a couple examples of personification and you can always go back and rewind and re-listen to the story and see if you can find them. For our setting, when does it take place? Does anyone figure out, is it the past, the present or the future? If you know, type it into your answers right now. Is it past in the comments, past, present or future? That's part of what we're gonna add to our win. Also, for when, we know it takes place on a Saturday, right? So we can say a Saturday. And we know it takes place during the day. It's daytime. But I want you to think in your head right now, was it in the past, present, or future based on the illustrations, the way that they talk? That's also part of the win. Where does it take place? Well, we know it takes place at Mamaw's house. And anyone figure out kind of what part of the country it was in? Was it, we definitely can kind of tell it's, they're speaking English. It's probably in the, somewhere where they speak English, right? And based on the illustrations and based on our author, we can probably infer it takes place in the United States. So based on her accent and the way she talks, I would infer it takes place somewhere maybe in the South, right? Maybe it's somewhere South. 
And then you would want to be more descriptive and describe to me what does Mama's house look like? Where at in her house? Describe her kitchen. Describe her outside yard. All of those things. And then environment weather for my older kiddos. The weather outside, hot, humid. Think of words to describe what the weather is like. And then the mood or the tone. I'm not going to answer this yet. I want you to think about this. Is the mood or tone scary, sad, frustrated, angry, happy? What is it? Think of the mood or tone of this book. That's also part of our study. So as part of the things that go with this, the little freebie documents that you can download, if you want to do this with your class or if, you're, if your teachers assign this to you, you'll see this activity. And it's a puzzle piece just like that. The place, the time, and the environment or the weather. So the where, the when, and the environment. And then you're going to combine all of those and write a one to two sentence summary, right? One to two sentence summary of where it takes place place, when it takes place, and the environment or weather. So that's that activity right there. And I have a little bit more for you guys. Before I let you go, I'm so glad you guys enjoyed this story. I see so many comments, people saying how, you know, they, I saw one about someone, um, you lost your grandmother, and I'm so sorry you lost your grandmother, but hopefully this helps you remember those good memories like he was able to do in the book. Other things that I want to challenge you to do is the theme. If you are in K through eight, you have been talking about theme, I'm sure this year. So this, this story has a very strong theme. I gave you a little theme activity that you can complete. Also, grammar. Oh my goodness, we forget grammar sometimes with our literacy lessons, right? So I did two different activities here based on your grade. If you're kindergarten first or second, there's an activity for you that has common and proper nouns. And you just have to cut them, oh, this side, cut them out and then paste them in the correct column for common or proper nouns. And then if you're older, maybe fourth, fifth, or sixth grade, I did plural and possessive nouns. So you can cut out the, oop, wrong side again, <laughs> the plural or possessive nouns and paste them in the correct column and add the apostrophes correctly. Then, next thing I want you, want you guys to do, those grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, they're missing you too. So let's practice our writing skills today. Just like Lester Laminac wrote and Chris Sunfiek, Soon Pete, I think it's Soon Pete is how you say it, the illustrator, just like they wrote the story to remember memories with the gra their mamaw, the grandmother, his grandmother, I want you to write a letter. So I have a friendly letter template in the downloads. You can write a letter to a family member about a memory you have with them, something that you loved doing with them. Tell them what you enjoyed so much. And then you can draw them a picture of you guys doing that together and put a little caption and, and mail it to them. If you write a letter, I'd love to see pictures of it. If you do any of activities, I'd love to see pictures of you doing them and sharing the story with everybody. And lastly, you ready for the fun one? Because I'm doing this today with my boys. I'm gonna share pictures and I hope you guys do too. Make tea cakes. I put a recipe card in the file for tea cakes and I put a blank one so you can write down other recipes and practice writing down recipes, which is a great writing activity. But I also put the actual recipe for tea cakes that I make with my class at school and then I'm gonna make with my boys at home. So you can make your own tea cakes. It's like four or five simple ingredients. That's eggs, flour, sugar, butter, vanilla, and baking soda. So six ingredients. Hopefully you can make tea cakes sometime this week to enjoy a memory, making a memory with your family. And I'd love to see pictures of you doing that. And then you can use the blank recipe cards to write your own recipes for family, family cooking things or family recipes that you guys have and you'll have them for yourself. So thank you so much for joining in. Please share pictures with me of all the things that you're learning. I love being your teacher for this time. I'd like to see you go off into workshop time sometime today, complete some of these activities and share pictures with your teacher, with me. But for right now, you can head over to the Get Your Teach On page. You can stay here or go to Hope and Wade King and you can do a class fit. There's gonna be an awesome dance workout for you guys to do. So have fun. Thank you for being here. Bye.